In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you, every last bit. He doesn't want part of your heart or part of your life or part of your family. He wants it all. He doesn't want to be just a guest in our homes. He wants to be a full-fledged family member right in the middle. He doesn't want to be an occasional part of your life. He wants to be at its very center around which everything else revolves and to which everything is connected. Jesus doesn't want part of it. He wants all of it. And maybe that sounds a little bit intrusive. Maybe that that sounds smothering. Maybe maybe it sounds a bit obsessive. And maybe there's a reason for that. Our God calls himself in the scripture, our Lord calls himself a a jealous God, doesn't he, in the Old Testament. And most of the time when we think of jealousy, we we view it in the negative sense, a negative trait or characteristic, a, a vice that someone has. They're jealous. That's not a good thing. But a mother who drops her her children off for the first time in a public place and and leaves them there, they're old enough to to be safe and to take care of themselves and make good decisions. She still tells them, don't you go home with anybody. Don't you get in anybody else's car. Don't go with someone that you don't know. In essence, she's saying, don't treat anyone else as though they are your mother. I am your mother. No one else is. And she's being awfully selfish. She's being jealous, but nobody complains about that because that's the way it's supposed to be. When a, when a husband turns to his wife and says, I don't want you to look to any other man to be your husband. I am your man. No one should rightly have a problem with that because that's how, that's how a marriage is supposed to work. And your, your boss at work, if, if your boss, if, if he asks you or she asks you to dedicate your efforts and your time and your attention and your sweat and blood and tears to to a full day's work in order to receive a full day's wage, your boss is being jealous with your time. But nobody should really complain about that because that is the way things are supposed to work. Why is it then when we hear when we hear these words about Jesus that our minds and our hearts they rankle a little bit? When I say, Jesus doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want part of your life, part of your heart, part of your family and your schedule and your time. He wants all of it. Why is it that that just sounds so invasive, so smothering, so selfish? Because aren't we tempted to to think, I mean, Jesus... You get a lot from me, don't you? You get my attention. You get my attention, full attention for a few hours on Sunday morning. You get my attention lots of different times during the week when I pray, when I read the scriptures, when I read my devotion. Jesus, you get, you get a portion of my income as an offering. Jesus, that's more than most people get from you, for you, or give to you. And, and maybe, maybe you ought to be satisfied with that part of me. I'm dedicating a lot of it to you. We think to ourselves, or our sinful nature thinks, why should all of my time be his? I mean, all of my, all the time I'm at work and at school, all the time I'm in recreation, and especially my vacation, does it all belong to Jesus as well? Like every time I consider how I'm going to spend my money, do I have to think of Jesus first? When I'm making decisions for my family and my priorities, must everything begin with Jesus? And the the simple answer is, yeah. All of it. Every bit of it. Jesus wants all of it. Because he knows this is best for you and for me. 
C.S. Lewis had this wonderful way of expressing that for Christians. He said, the Christian faith, if it's false, it's of no value. If it's true, it is of infinite value. The only thing that Christian faith cannot be is of moderate value, moderately important. You get what that means? That means that if, if our Christian faith is false, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, well, then you can take or leave all of these things. And, and quite frankly, if it's false and you're taking it and dedicating your time and energy toward it, you're a fool. But since it is true, and we know it is true, this word is, has value both for this life and for the life to come, all this value. It's of infinite importance. It is, it is greater than all things. The only thing that this Christian faith can't be for us is, is kind of important or, or pretty important or even really, really important, something that we dedicate a lot of things to. See, this Christian faith, this relationship with our Savior, it isn't like a, a hobby that we have. You know, those hobbies that you get and that, that you get fired up for and you dedicate time and energy and resources and all of these things to this hobby because it provides you joy. But then when important things come along, you rightly make the decision, I don't have time for the hobby. I don't have the resources to put into that hobby any longer. It doesn't mean that I don't like it or it's unimportant, but, but it's not as important as these things. No, this life with Christ... It's, it's greater and it's bigger than your occupation. It, it's bigger and it's greater and it's more important than the plans that you have for the future. Jesus would say, your life with me is even more important than your family. Bigger than your family. And you know that when he says that, the devil wants you to convince you that what Jesus is saying, you love me instead of your family, but that's not what Jesus gives us there. Jesus would tell us, you love your family best by loving me first. You are more useful to your family, fathers. You are better for your family and for your loved ones when you love him first, when you place him above all things, when he's at the center of this life and everything flows from it. When Jesus was, was on his way to Jerusalem, skirting this Samaritan village, he was met by a few people that needed to hear this message, this message of his all-pervasive, all-important love. And the way that he deals with them really helps us and teaches us some lessons and encourages us in our Christian faith. So the first man comes to him, and he's, he sounds like he's full of confidence. He is absolutely sure. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I can do this. I'm ready for this. But Jesus, with his omniscience, was able to, to see what this man needed to hear. And so he said simply, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has, has no place to lay his head. So maybe this man just needed to understand that if you're going to follow me, that, that wealth and comfort and earthly glory, they are not promised along this road. They, they aren't guaranteed. In fact, it, it might be just the opposite. Didn't Paul figure that out? One of the things that God said about Paul when, when he called him to be his disciple, his apostle, he said, I'll show you how much you're going to have to suffer how much you'll suffer for my name. Joyfully suffer for my name. And Paul did. Elisha, with his words, Elisha wasn't turning back from the call that Elijah had given him. Elisha was turning and setting his house in order that what would have been a, a, a comfortable life. He was a man of wealth. Twelve yoke of oxen. He takes slaughters, burns the farming equipment, gives it to the village, throws a feast because, because he had been called to be a servant of the God Most High. <laughs> In fact, Elisha was doing anything but turning back from the plow. He was consumed with that work. And so we learn a little bit of a lesson. Following Jesus means that he comes before my earthly comfort. 
that following Jesus sometimes means denying myself something that my sinful flesh might want for it to be comfortable or, or something that this world, that this sinful flesh loves, prioritizes. Sometimes we turn away from those things. Two other men, when Jesus met them along the way, Jesus directly comes to them and says simply, I want you to follow me. And, and they express this willingness initially. Yeah, I want to do that, Jesus, but, but I have a few things that i got to take care of first. The one man, I, 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 my, my elderly uh, parent, I'm, I need to go and take care of and, 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 and make sure that they, they receive a, a good burial. The other one, he just had, had excuses. And although it seems that Jesus is speaking really harshly to them, in a way that, you know, the things that they're saying, the world would never argue with those being legitimate, but Jesus seems to know better and more deeply that this is, these are false excuses, that this is equivocating, that this is being evasive and rationalizing, not following him. And so the words that he speaks to them are actually loving. He's pointing out, I know you think that that's a good excuse, but it doesn't hold water. And I think sometimes God does that for us in his word. The, the, the ways that we rationalize our sin or our grudges or our priorities, we look at those things and, and the world looks at us and says, yep, I actually absolutely see why you do that, why those are your priorities, why you won't forgive him or her. And our hearts think, yes, the, Lord agree, the, the world agrees with us, so we're absolutely in the right. But then God comes along with his law, and he says, I see more deeply than this world sees. And you know very well those are lame excuses. And so we, we learn another lesson. The devil is delighted when we always have Jesus near the top of our lives. The devil loves it when Jesus is really important for us. When he's almost absolutely important for us. When he's always near the top but, but never quite gets to the, to the great priority. The, the one around whom all things revolve in our lives. And so we learn that following Jesus sometimes means we need to be ready to make sacrifices. We need to be ready to reorder the priorities that we have in this earthly life. Now these, these have been called the, the difficult sayings of Jesus, and maybe they are. They're not, not necessarily uh, joyful to hear, and they aren't always joyful to proclaim. These words, they cause us to, to examine our hearts and our priorities and our habits. They cause us to... <laughs> to take a second thought and examine the way that we rationalize those things and make excuses for those things. But before, we, before you tune out, plug up your ears, before I get tired of preaching the law this morning, you remember how Luke starts this section, this middle section of his gospel. We sang about it, the beginning of that, that great hymn, What Grace Is This? Our Lord, Luke says, set out resolutely for Jerusalem. The way that the hymn writer put it is, he sets his face towards suffering. To be resolute means that he was determined to go to Jerusalem knowing full well what was waiting for him there. Nothing was going to stop him. He was determined. Nothing was more important than the work he was to do in Jerusalem because what he was going to Jerusalem to do was to bear away the sin of the world. And if he's doing that, he's doing it for you too. Nothing was more important than your sin being forgiven. Nothing for him was more important than your salvation. And we rejoice in that. He shows this resolute determination to do all that is necessary to save us who sometimes are so unwilling to do all that is necessary. Unwilling to give everything that we have. Unwilling to let go of our own excuses and priorities. What a Savior we have. The Lamb of God came to take away the sin of the world, and so he came to take away yours. 
He's 100% committed to this for all of us who fall short. We thank God that, that Jesus doesn't want just part of us. That he's unsatisfied until he has all of us. What a comfort that is as, as we are a congregation that, that pauses over the past few weeks and again over the course of the next few weeks as we pause at different times to remember God's faithfulness to those who he's called home to himself. What a God we have to be thankful for. A Savior who was relentless, who would not give up until he had what was his, till he had what was purchased with his blood, till he had those he had claimed with baptism to be his forever. What a Savior we have that he has that same love for you and for me too. We rejoice that he has purchased us for himself. And in the Luther's explanation to the, to the second article, why did he do this? He, all this he did so that I should be his alone, so that I should live under him in his kingdom, so that I should be able to live with him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. And to that and to our Savior's word this morning, we say, this is most certainly true. Amen. Now the peace of God which...